Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We're going to start off first with a radar animation back on the 27th. This was in the late afternoon. Geographically, uh, you're in Texas, so here's Lubbock. There's the Red River Valley, just for some kind of uh, broad-scale uh, geographical view here. What I want you to watch is the supercell that comes off of this line and splits and moves to the right. We have a name for these. We call them right-moving supercells. And it was interesting because not only was it producing a, a lot of hail and also a tornado that eventually was quite photogenic as this moved over toward this town of uh, Electra here, but uh, this particular type of weather phenomena, these splitting supercells and right moving supercells like this are quite impressive to just watch and learn about. And I thought you might like to see this. So I'm going to take you over here and show you a simulation. When I used to teach about this uh, at the university, um, this was an animation that I like to use. So it, it requires a very highly sheared environment. But what ends up happening to get these supercells to split is that as the uh, updraft rises like this, you can take that what was once horizontally aligned shear, tilt it into the vertical, creating two separate bits of rotation. See them there? Then in the center of the storm is the downdraft forms. It actually pulls those two areas apart and creates two separate storms, a left moving and a right moving supercell. And that's basically what this animation was showing. Now, I'm not a mesoscale dynamicist, and, but this was the way that I used to teach about this. And that was what was causing that one cell, the one on the south side here, to split and, and, and move off to the right. We didn't see much of a left mover in this situation. But the reality of all this was they were producing quite a bit of hail. And the weather system that produced that is still kind of hanging around in that area. You see, here's the upper level flow right now. Large ridge comes into the west, quickly dives down into this trough. But you can see how this trough is closed off. It's cut off, and the main flow zips ahead of it here through the Midwest, heading off to the northeast. And the fact that that has cut itself off means it's going to linger and stick around there for a while. It is also the reason why the boundary that is basically stretching off to the east of this is not moving. I'd like to show what I mean. Let's just step down in the atmosphere. We'll go down to about a mile above our heads here at 850 millibars. And what you can see is that right in through this area, okay, the flow on one side is coming out of this direction and the flow on the other side is coming there. So there's nothing really to move the boundary along. Do you notice that the flow is parallel to it, not um, necessarily pushing it in one direction or the other? And the net result of that has been a lot of flooding. I'll show you in just a few moments. But take a look at some of this satellite imagery from yesterday. So this was in the afternoon, and you can see down here in Texas some large storms popping off on that boundary. And as I was watching these, you could see in some of the satellite imagery, the shadows that were cast, including uh, what was some very clear overshooting tops. That's basically where the updraft has so much momentum that it, uh, you know, temporarily, briefly breaks into the stratosphere, a very stable layer. And storms like this that produce these overshooting tops and have these very vigorous updrafts, of course, can produce quite a bit of hail. And just looking here at the last 24 hours of maximum estimated hail size data, uh, this was confirmed with some of the storm reports that some of these storms down here were producing two to four inch hailstones. And I imagine some of them were even getting a little bit bigger than that. But that boundary, just look at what it did here as I kind of walk you through this. You can see the upper level cutoff low in New Mexico. But you see how much moisture is out ahead of this. And that, that particular setup, let's just get this playing and watch it again. The upper level low here, the boundary stretched right between basically Texas through Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. We just saw a tremendous amount of flooding in parts of the Mid-South because of this. Looking back over the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation, from Texas through Oklahoma, Arkansas, into Missouri, that was our stretch of heavy, very heavy rainfall some places picking up in excess of six inches. Now, I don't want to leave out what was happening here in Colorado because we did see some impressive supercells develop there, including several tornado reports. And uh, so there was on the back side of this uh, some severe weather earlier on in the week as well. But if we just kind of stitch this all together, this is the last seven days worth of total accumulated precipitation. Last week, the heavy rain down here in this side of the Cotton Belt, and then through the Mid-South, right into this area coming out of Oklahoma to Arkansas, Missouri yesterday. Some places that have not seen much precipitation after the pattern broke away from the colder weather, you know, get into the section of Kansas, part of Nebraska, big sections of Iowa, northern Illinois, Wisconsin, even over into Michigan. And also the very dry regions here that we've had in the Dakotas, the moisture that did return over the last seven days was not substantial in a way that could help correct that drought. 
So overall, we would look at this and see that there were some places in through here that probably had wide open planting windows. But what are we dealing with today? This is our all hazards weather map. And a lot of what you see through here is related to the thunderstorm environment still in place, including some tornado watches, also some flash flood watches and warnings into this area. And that's where that stalled out boundary is. We have over here uh, in the east, this is risk of, of, of high winds uh, in this area too. If we just kind of go in and look at a few of these factors influencing that uh, particular map, I want to take you back to a map I've been showing you quite a bit. It's the top 100 centimeters or top three feet of soil moisture percent uh, percentile. So as we see the moisture move into the eastern Corn Belt, that's going to be very, uh, very, very good. Uh, I know it's going to keep us out of fields, but I want to see that moisture return uh, to the profile here. We're quite dry in pockets here uh, in, in Iowa, southern Minnesota, and parts of Wisconsin. We've been discussing the drought that's in the southern Canadian prairie, getting into North Dakota, South Dakota, and eastern Montana. And so this is, uh, this is just a reminder as to where we're still needing to make some major improvements in soil moisture. So today, risk of strong to severe storms stretches parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley through the Tennessee Valley, Ohio Valley, and then eventually here into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and possibly into New York as well. So we're going to watch that boundary slowly migrate to the east. And we can see that here by going to the high res NAM model. So this is through about 6, 7 o'clock this morning right there. So right along that boundary, the heaviest rain is still falling. As I play this forward, you're going to see the boundary move its way. Notice the storms late this afternoon and this evening pulling right in through parts of West Virginia on top of the Appalachian Mountains, but through eastern Kentucky, Tennessee, and stretching into northern Alabama and Mississippi. Now, I'm just going to play this, and I want you to see the overall flow. One low curls up into the northeast, but the cutoff low in Texas remains there. So if I go backward, you're going to see this again. So the low pulls into the northeast. By the time we get into uh, the overnight hours tonight, early tomorrow morning, and yes, coming through Ontario, possibly getting into New York, we could be looking at some scattered snow showers out of this. But that upper level low that's just still spinning over Texas continues to draw in the moisture, and we're going to see continued storms here while much of the rest of the country goes into a quieter weekend overall. So just looking through 7 a.m. on Saturday, this is from the high res NAM total accumulated precipitation. Now, again, some of this fell last night. This was the zero Z run. Uh, so we, this data you know, started last night at 8 p.m. Uh, but again, you can see where the heaviest precipitation is forecast to be. Overall, I'd say the European model did the best job last week in forecasting this. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to continue to rely on its performance as we move forward here. So let's use it and go right to the upper levels of the atmosphere. Okay, so the first feature we watched is the cutoff low. Here's the main wave to the north that pulls into the northeast and gives us that system tomorrow. The cutoff low hangs out over Texas. There it is. And even through the start of the weekend, it continues to draw that Gulf moisture into Texas, giving us those storms. Now that cutoff low gets pulled back into the flow uh, over the weekend and starts to move through uh, the, the, um, you know, the Mid-South over toward the Ohio River Valley. I'll show you what it does in a few moments. But behind it, we have another wave that comes in. This one right in through here on the evening of Monday, May 3rd. And that comes right out of the you know, Arizona, New Mexico and pulls here into uh, Texas again. And we're going to watch this wave. It looks pretty vigorous here from the third into the fourth and to see what that does in terms of precipitation and potentially severe weather. Meanwhile, though, as the pattern evolves into next Wednesday, we generally see a trough over the east, a broad ridge that moves through the mountains into the into the plains here and the Gulf of, excuse me, yeah, the Gulf of Alaska, but the Pacific is largely in an unblocked flow. Do you see that? We've kind of been keeping that as our narrative for a while now. And as we then get into next Friday and Saturday, this could start to return the moisture late next week uh, into the Pacific Northwest. But the flow kind of flattens out, as we discussed, and stays pretty far to the north, which means our week two signals are going to be rather, um, well, they're going to be weak. So let's go take a look at it from the high res NAM. We've seen already through Friday and now into early Saturday morning. Here's the cutoff low as we work the way into Saturday, continuing to produce the risk of strong to severe storms south of the Red River Valley, right in through here. So that's Saturday evening. As we then progress through the day, the low starts to move. This is Sunday morning. 
afternoon and evening. So as we said, it moves into the Mid-South. So we're going to watch this area by the time we get out to Sunday evening for the risk of strong to severe storms. Now to the north of that, in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Missouri, and Iowa, is there a chance for some light precipitation? There is out of this, but that main wave is pretty far to the south and it gets out pretty quickly. So that means that those folks that have seen those open planting windows in here, this is not the kind of precipitation coming through over the weekend uh, to, to shut us down. All right. And we'll take a look at those totals in a moment. Well, what we've got now is by the time we get into the third, fourth, remember that's when that next wave was coming in like this. We're going to keep a close eye on this region for the potential for the risk of severe storms as we go out of Monday into Tuesday. And that wave starts to pull through Missouri, Arkansas, into southern Illinois. Once we get into, uh, you know, Tuesday afternoon and evening, and that's going to spread some more rain right over this region where we've seen quite a bit of it and extend those thunderstorms farther to the south. All right. Meanwhile, let's just keep playing this on through. That wave leaves. We go into the 5th, 6th, and 7th with that flatter flow, but systems start to come in here to coastal Oregon and Washington. But that's why you don't see much going on here, the 5th, 6th, and 7th in the midsection of the United States. We put all that together. Look at this model difference. Ready? This is what the European model has for the next seven days. And I just want to take note that as we talked about that precipitation coming through this part of the western corn belt, uh, on uh, over the weekend, it's not going to be substantial. We have the stalled out boundary here. We have the wave ejecting finally out of Texas, and then the next wave that comes in. And the net effect of all of that is to not slow the pattern down in this area. Okay. Now, what does the GFS say about that? Well, the GFS with that next wave that comes through tries to bring in a bit more precipitation into this corridor here, where we've seen some wide open planting windows. So there are some subtle differences. One of the big problems with this, the waves are not deep enough to return a lot of moisture to California. And the area where we would want to see some of the spring rain coming in, it is not materializing. It, the wave is just too far to the south. And, uh, you know, it's, it is getting to be, um, we're getting a bit into dire straits here in the Dakotas with not returning the spring moisture to this point. And I'm very concerned about how things are going to progress uh, there forward. Looking out at the GFS Ensemble, day 10. So now we're going to look at week two. Now the flow is doing something a bit like that. You see how it's quite flat and, and doesn't, you know, show a lot of features. And as a result of that, you look out the week two precipitation forecast and all of our anomalies are really just tucked away right inside here, very close to average. So it's not really giving us a strong signal one way or the other. Does the European model say the same thing? Well, it has that same ridge, the weaker trough in the west and the deeper trough taking off the east coast here. But it also has very, you know, you're just on either side of the zero line here in terms of precipitation anomalies. It is a bit more aggressive with bringing that wave into the northwest, so better coastal precipitation for Oregon, Washington. And largely speaking, it's trying to just keep, you know, chances for storms in this area that do eventually move to the northeast, getting out there to the middle part of, of the month of May, which we anticipated May being a stormy month with a lot of subtle features. So this is still playing into that forecast. Let's switch over and talk about temperatures, though. Uh, this map, again, is just the European model forecast for the next 10 days. This is the operational zero Z run. And what I'm showing you here in gray are locations where we are anticipating uh, a frost, a temperature getting below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. OK, from there, let's go take a look at those actual highs. We're going to start off today on Thursday. So what we've got right in through here is where the frontal boundary sits. So that's where our cooler conditions exist, but very warm in the west, getting into the Columbia Basin, the Snake River Valley, interior parts of Oregon, and 90s in the Central Valley of California from the Sacramento Valley down to the San Joaquin. Very warm conditions there as that ridge pulls in. So what happens to that heat? Well, by the time we get into Friday, it's in Montana and in the Dakotas while the cool air exits to the northeast. We've got some very chilly air for this time of year in the northeast. This is Saturday's high temperatures getting into Sunday. The warmth moves into the Midwest over to the Eastern Corn Belt. And then going into next week, this is Monday and Tuesday. That's when that next wave, remember we, they were subtle, but we were talking about them sliding through here. So to the north, we've just got slightly cooler conditions, three, four, five, six degrees cooler than average. We do see we're talking highs here on Tuesday 
approaching 60s, you know, in this area. So this is not a cold snap that would have me overly concerned. From there, let's just go look at the day 5 through 10 pattern. Just a slight adjustment here from earlier in the week where the GFS is now just bringing in, you know, a little bit cooler than normal conditions into this area. But this is not the Arctic outbreak we would worry about. And over the same time period, the GFS compared to the European, well, the European pushes it farther to the east and gets it out quicker. And that's why when you go out there to the day 10 to 15 pattern, now we start to see something doing a bit more like that in the flow. So maybe some cooler weather as we work our way toward mid-month for the northwest, the Canadian prairie and the northern plains. But when I say cooler, we're just a few degrees on this side of cooler than normal. The pattern is very flat as we discussed. Now, lastly, let's go ahead and show you the um, GFS. But from there, I want to get into a discussion about where this where this is kind of all going. So to take a look at this. Uh, next, MJO. Well, the MJO is broken into phase eight and is expected to come into phase one and two and then start to head its you know overall weekly into phase two and three. Now, why this is so important to be paying attention to is because when we see the MJO this time of year, over the Indian Ocean. If it's high amplitude through phase two, three, and four, that's a signal for a later season frost, especially for the eastern half of, of the United States. And when we when I when I think about that, I just want to take you back to a year ago. So the end of April through the beginning of May, we saw the MJ go MJO, excuse me, progress out of the Indian Ocean and then toward phase four uh, and five, which is over into this area here, just north of Australia. All right. Now, when it did that, that was a part of setting us up with a, a temperature pattern and jet stream level pattern that uh, got highly amplified. Okay. So we had a large ridge here, a deep trough that was in the Gulf of Alaska that ridged out the West Coast and brought another deep trough into basically from the Hudson Bay to the Great Lakes. And it was this deep trough a year ago at the beginning of May that ushered in a lot of cold air that made it very far to the south as the flow, again, kind of stacked up. You can see a high over a low and a high here over a low. That's that, that stacked up pattern that we had a year ago that brought in that frost. So just to remind you, May 7th through May 12th, we brought sub-freezing temperatures down into the eastern Corn Belt, clear into Tennessee and Virginia, and uh, spent several hours there below uh, with the colder air. And it took a while to break that block down. So if you remember last year, we had a very, very slow accumulation of our heat units here uh, in the eastern Corn Belt, in the Mid-South, getting up into the Northeast, while the West was so very warm to start things off. And even though we had a rapid plant, similar to what we're doing right now in Iowa, remember the month of May last year ended up getting quite cloudy and quite cool in this area. This is a cumulative solar downward flux anomaly map showing you how much we lacked in sunshine here due to a lot of cloud cover. So I'm showing you this because you're, you should be questioning me, is this going to happen again? Well, right now, take a look at what the MJO is doing. It's progressing here over through phases one and two and three, unlike a year ago where it was popping out over into this area. And as a, a result of all of that, we look out here pretty long term, day 11 through 15. And again, we just don't see the MJO cranking through these phases, which would signal the cooler bias or the cooler risks here. On top of that, as I already presented to you, the models are not advertising any sort of blocked flow in either the North Pacific or the North Atlantic as we work our way through May. And the net effect of that is this is why they give you this forecast for May 6th through the 13th. And that's a pretty far cry from what we had in 2020. So we'll wrap it up there. I'll give you the new updates again next week. Have a good one. Thanks.